Marching on, the church is marching on. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching on. The church is marching on. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on. Marching on. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on. Is marching on. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on. On. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is marching, is marching on.
Let's rise up and sing together. For the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we walk
us quietly close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you because of the call you have given us, as well as the challenge that you are giving us. Lord, we know that if we only trust and obey, much will be done to the glory of your name. And Father, we are praying that in every situation, when it appears that our strength will fail us, we pray that your spirit will remind us to trust and to obey. Amen. And the victory that follows all the people that trust in you, we pray will follow us in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray that in this brief conference we're having, you will challenge our hearts. Amen. So that, Lord, the work you have given us will prosper and succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us all that we need. Amen. And help us that in trusting and obeying, Amen. we'll do everything you want us to do. Amen. So that on the last day, when we meet face to face with the Lord who has called us, we'll be able to hear those beautiful words from him. Well done, good and faithful servant. And our reward will be for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This session we're briefly looking at the word of God on courage for victory. And I'm reading from Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. From verse 6 all through to verse 9. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be thou strong, and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. This session I'm talking on courage for victory. I have read this part of the book of Joshua for some few reasons. Number one. The life of the minister of the gospel is very similar to the life of Joshua. And the life of the church itself and the experiences of the church are very similar to the experiences of the children of Israel at different points in their history. If you look at Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For what things soever, whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It will benefit leaders and preachers if many times we read of leaders in Old Testament times, leaders like Abraham, like David like Moses, like Joshua, then like the prophets of the Old Testament. For the basic reason that we're told here, what things were written aforetime, before this time, or before the New Testament dispensation, they were written for our learning, that we through comfort and patience of scriptures might have hope. And this is one of the reasons why we're studying from Joshua, so that we can have courage for victory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, it says now, all these things happened unto them for examples. That, and they are written for our admonition of our teaching or instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Again, we are being told that all the things we're reading about Israel, 
were reading about them so that discouragement lessons from their lives some encouragement from their lives because the things that happened to them happened for example and we who are living in this age of the end we have a lot to learn from them and as we read from the lives of some of these men i have mentioned in the old testament you'll begin to discover how the lord saw them through and how the lord can see you through as well as we talk about courage for victory and we outline the life and the ministry of joshua in particular let's begin to think about the ministry of joshua one joshua was not altogether the founder of the program or the ministry that he was carrying through in joshua chapter one god himself referred to moses who had been before joshua and he told him that moses my servant is dead now therefore arise go over this jordan thou and all these people in a way whatever we do in the church there are others who have gone beyond us and before us the apostles the prophets the foundation leaders of the new testament they have set the principles and god had spoken to them and much work had been done by them and anything we do now we can refer back to the new testament church and we can carry on from where they have started not only that even though these people have started and we are now following on you remember that joshua needed to lead a new generation to canaan land moses had died and many of the elders had also died but joshua had the privilege as well as responsibility of leading this new generation to the possession of the land now even though the apostles and the prophets had ministered but the people they ministered to in jerusalem in judea in samaria even the uttermost part of the earth of their day all those people had passed away here we are in our own country we're leading a new generation to the blessings of the lord himself and like joshua we take this new generation the people that live around us now we take them to the promised land all that moses did would not have profited this new generation if joshua failed in his work and all that the apostles had done peter james john all those apostles whatever they did and they did great mighty things but all those things will not profit the nigerians or the people in our own generation if you fail if i fail to lead the people of this generation into the promise of the lord because of that there are similarities between what joshua did and what we are doing not only that joshua felt he was incapable weak that he couldn't do what the lord was calling him to do because of the greatness of the task and how many times we have felt that we couldn't do the things the lord had called us to do the task is so great and in the language of the apostle paul who is sufficient for all these things it only takes the grace of god but not only that the people in canaan the perisites the jebusites the hittites the hivites they were ready for joshua and for the people of um, joshua that we will see how they will enter in into the land that they say that god has given them the enemies were strong the enemies were well fortified and many of them were warriors and champions at fighting and they were determined that joshua and the people will not enter into the land if you look around you evangelism becomes more and more difficult every day the people who are sinners they know that we're out to evangelize when we, when they read our banners our handbills our posters that we're coming to evangelize we want to win souls to christ a lot of religions and they're standing on guard and they are saying we're staying here we're waiting for them 
like the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Hivites, and they are saying, we're going to see how they will penetrate. You know what Joshua wanted to do by the calling of the Lord? He was to take the whole land and convert the whole land to the land of Israel. And they wouldn't allow him to do that in a very easy way. And he said there was no way. It will not be done. Jericho was shut up. Ai's people were well prepared. How similar to our own situation today. That a lot of people in various religions, they are saying no Christianity, not in this land. Our children, our wives, our young men, our people will not accept conversion. We know where we are. We know where we are going. And we are not going to be Christians. And they are going to be Christians. Amen. Because the power of God that worked with Joshua, a greater power is of the church of the living God. Amen. And as we march on, and as we sang, we are able to go up and take the land. But it's not going to be for boys. It's going to be for men. It's not for people who are not trained, tried, and people who are willing to be courageous in the face of battle. You know, many people, when they are young, they feel if they can only go out there and preach, they know that within a short time they will win all this country over to the Lord. Then they go to the field and they meet a little difficulty. And they say, I didn't know this is how it is. And they run back to the church. And they say, well, if I am just in the amen corner, saying amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, let the people go, we'll be praying for them. Two years ago, he said, no, I will go myself. I can do it. But now he's coming to the amen corner. The battle of the Lord is not for boys. It's for men. Men who are trained and tried and in the power of the Lord, they are courageous. That is the reason we're looking at this book of Joshua to see how to be courageous in the day of battle and in the ministry that God has given into our hands to know that he has all the power and all the strength so that we will succeed. And I believe we can succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua left, Moses left Joshua with some 12 elders, not very many. And these 12 elders that passed through the land, the wilderness, 10 had died, remaining just Joshua and Caleb. A younger generation had come up, and these people had been untrained. Even Joshua himself had not been completely trained. There was a time he tried to go into battle with Amalek. When Moses was still alive, and Aaron was alive and Ur, and Joshua went out and he tried to fight, he discovered something. It's only, it was only when Moses' hands were up that he succeeded. When Moses' hands were down, the Amalekites defeated him. And that was all the history he had in the past of fighting the battle of the Lord. Now there is no Moses to lift up any hand. Aaron had even gone, and all was nowhere to be found. And they were the borders of Canaan. No wonder he sat still. He folded his arm until God called him and said, Joshua, arise. The work is for you. He looked around, and yes, God said, I know what you are thinking about. Moses is dead, but I am alive. <laughs> Many of us, all the history we have behind us is that I tried that before. But I failed. The only battle we, uh, we tried to fight in our lives before, it was only through the help of another person raising up his hand that we succeeded. But that person is not even in your church now. You are left alone as a pastor, as an evangelist. And you say, what will I do? My prayer partners have gone to start their own ministry. And God says, I'm here with you. I am still alive. And you need to just pick up the courage that whether people are around or not, by the grace of God, in the power of the Lord, you are well able. You remember Peter and all the rest of the apostles. 
Before Jesus went away, Peter said, Even if everybody is denying you, I know that I will not deny you. I will do it. Even if I was to die with you, I am ready. And all the other disciples too, they said the same. And Judas Iscariot looked at all of them. And maybe he thought in his heart, I'll see how you will do when I bring them up. And eventually, he brought them up. And Jesus said, who are you seeking for? And he said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, if you're looking for me, here am I. But let these people go. And all of a sudden, Peter drew out a sword. He wanted to cut the head of that servant, but he only cut the ear. Symbolizing that in your own strength, in your own power, to fight the battle of the Lord, you may aim at cutting the head, only the ear can you cut. In your own strength. And when he saw that he couldn't go beyond cutting the ear, then he drew back and the cock crew. And then Jesus looked at him. And Jesus must have indicated, you see now how far you can go? Only the cutting of an ear. And he went to we because he saw he was a failure. Complete failure. And Jesus rose on the third day. And after Jesus rose up, he said, go and call me my disciples and Peter. Let them meet me in Galilee. And as they met him, without ever talking about their failure, because he wanted them to succeed, he said, go ye into all the world. To the people who have failed in their own strength, to the people who could not go beyond cutting an ear in their own strength. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. But before that time, wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And they waited. And surprisingly, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all sitting with one accord. And the Holy Ghost came upon them. And the people came to make fun. They said, these people are drunk. You know the person that rose up? His name is Peter. In the power of the Lord. And he started talking without even referring to any note. And he referred to Joel, he referred to David, he referred to Christ. And eventually he pointed at the people and said, you crucified the Lord. Peter of all people. Bold like that. And the people trembled in their shoes. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he was quick to tell them, repent. And they repented. 3,000 were born again in one day. The same God who turned weak Peter into bold Peter. That same God is here today. Amen. Says, I am God, I change not. And Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Now, in the battle ahead of us, the planting of the church, the growing of the church, and the maturing of the people that God has committed into our hands, we need courage. Look at Joshua chapter 1 again. Verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Why did God have to repeat three times over? In a very short passage to this man, Joshua, that he needs to be very courageous. Number one, because of the enemy. We are very, very fearful. When I talk about enemy, there are different categories and strengths of enemy. Number one, the enemy within. Within the man himself. In every man, there is an inborn natural weakness and timidity. That makes him afraid of facing the future. What if I fail? What if I don't succeed as Moses succeeded? What if I'm not able to control these people 
as Moses controlled them. What if they see that I am inexperienced? There is an inward enemy, inner enemy, that lives with the average man every day. And God knew that in the heart of every man, there is that timidity or that fear that lives on the inside that will be checking him every time you could fail. You may not make it. You may not succeed. And people will know that you do not have what you pretend or what you think you have. Because of that, God repeated three times to Joshua. And he said, be courageous. And if you are sincere with yourself, since you became a minister, every time you are going to have a new program, that enemy within may be talking. Suppose you don't make it. Suppose you fail. People might be watching you. Suppose they see that you don't have the qualities and the gifts that you pretend to have or you think you have. Because of that, you need the voice of God telling you, be thou courageous. Not only because of the fear and the weakness, but because of the shortcoming. Sometimes a person has a shortcoming. Seeing that he has not overcome in his own heart, in his own life. And privately, that thing will be biting at him, staring at him. And every time that he wants to take a bold step, that thing will be saying from within, you know who you are? You want to go and challenge the devil outside? And the devil will try to be terrifying that man, saying, I will expose you. You want to cast out devils? You want to uh, destroy the works of the devil openly? I, yes, go on. Let's go for a drama. You expose me. I expose you too. And because of that fear, because of that devil terrifying, we need the voice of the Lord saying, give me that sin. Confess that sin to me. Hand everything over to me. And let the devil expose whatever he wants to expose. I'll cover you up. When you hand over everything to the Lord and you say, Lord, oh yes, in the past I have not been an angel. I have not been as I ought to be. And this sin has been trailing my steps and following me, trying to weaken my hand, saying that because I did those things many years ago or many months ago because of that now, I cannot even arise and do something concrete for the Lord. But Lord, I'm going to expose it to you. I'm going to forsake that thing. And then you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And because you are washed in the blood, you become the righteousness of God in Christ. And next time the devil says, uh, I'm going to expose you, you say, go ahead and do it. It's like a man I heard of. He got a new job in a new place. And it was where they were cooking and uh, helping to have uh, people having delicious meals. And the first day he got there, the person who was his boss uh, said, would you mind to do overtime for me today? I'll pay you the money. And he said, oh yes, I will, I will do it. But he killed a lot of chicken in that place. And uh, when that man left, according to the story, I heard it from a preacher, the preacher said, that boss, he was on top. And this man looked left and right and, and thought that everybody had gone. And he stole chicken, put under his clothes, and eventually when he finished his work, he went away. The second day, the boss came, appeared that he didn't know anything, and then, and then called him and said, um, would you mind doing some uh, overtime today, but I will not pay you today. There's no money, but you must do the overtime. I said, no, I'm going to visit my family at home. I will not do that overtime. And uh, the fellow said, you remember the chicken you saw yesterday? <laughs> and he wondered, did he know I saw you? And if you don't do that overtime for me, I will expose you. He said, don't worry, I will do it, I will do it. <laughs> And he did it that day. And the following day, again, when they closed for the normal hours, and um, he, uh, the man came again and said, um, 
Hey, over time today, said, no, I'm very busy. Uh, you remember the chicken? I will do it, I will do it. <laughs> and he continued like that. And one day he said, uh, will you do overtime today? He said, well, you are troubling me every day. Well, this overtime, and you are not paying me. Uh, I will tell the boss, if you don't, uh, if you don't do it, they will terminate your appointment. Then he did it. Then he felt, why should I be a servant and a slave all my life for one chicken? So the following day, he decided he'll go to the boss himself. And he went to the boss. And he said, boss, I'm ashamed of myself did something dirty, something I shouldn't have done. And it's so bad. In fact, I feel like the ground should just swallow me up. And the boss said, what is it you did that is so serious? The first day you employed me in this place, the devil tempted me, and I stole chicken. And I just came to tell you so that whatever you will do, uh, just to know that this is what I did. The boss looked at him and said, even with the courage of coming to confess that, don't worry about it. Forget about it. You are forgiven. But his immediate boss did not know that he had confessed. <laughs> so the following day, after the man had confessed to the big, big boss, the other fellow said, uh, today, over time, ah, he said, not on your life. I am not a cheap man doing overtime for anybody at any time. And the fellow said, you remember the chicken? He said, what chicken? <laughs> and uh, he said, I will go and tell the big boss, go ahead and go and tell him. <laughs> the confession made him free. Our confession makes us free. When the devil has been threatening and weakening your hand, I will report you. I will expose you. I will do this and do that. You go to God yourself and say, God, nothing the devil has been threatening about. Look at what I did. And then you are cleansed in the blood of Jesus. Washed in the blood of Jesus. And any time you are to cast out devil, you are to heal the sick, you are to hold the crusade. And devil said, you remember this? You say, remember what? Now it's nothing at all. I will expose you. Expose what? what the blood of Jesus had forgiven and forgotten, then you become free. And I was telling you that God knew that because of the internal inward enemy, one, the weakness of our nature, two, the shortcomings, but once all these things are settled, then we'll be courageous. We'll go to the Lord, we'll nail those things on the cross of Calvary, and we're set free. But not only that, the enemies within the household of faith. You know, Paul the Apostle said, Treblings and fears within and without. And sometimes he complained, he said, In perils of water, in perils of my own countrymen, those who are not born again, but in perils among false brethren. That's why we need courage. Enemy within, we deal with the enemies within by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the enemies all around, they won't leave the church, but they won't cooperate in the church. Every new thing that has to be done, they oppose age. They say, no, there's no money for that. There is no time for that. The church cannot do that now. And these are the things the Lord himself is laying upon your heart, that they must be done so that the church will grow. They say, no, not yet. What do you do? That's why God told Joshua, be thou courageous, because he knew, one, the enemies within, within that man's own bosom. And then two, the enemies within the household of faith, those who are saying, we are not able. We, can do, we cannot do that now. It is not yet time now. And yet, how do you overcome those? You overcome the enemy within you by the blood of Jesus. The enemies around you by the love of Jesus. Just love them. Because they profess to belong to Christ. And it is your love that will conquer them. The one within, it is the blood that will conquer them. But then Joshua did not only have enemies all around. Some of the people, Israelites, that were saying, no, we are not going to do it. No, it is not time. There were enemies outside there. The Canaanites. The people of Jericho. And the doors were strictly shut 
against Joshua. But then he knew that by the power of the Spirit, he could overcome those enemies outside. The blood, the love, and the Spirit. That if you will understand in your own life that if there are weaknesses and shortcomings, then plead the blood of Jesus. Have cleansing in the blood of Jesus. But if there are individuals in the church, in your local assembly, and they are proving difficult, love them in Christ. And let the love of God cover all the things they are bringing up. But if there are enemies outside opposing your work, let your faith arise. And the anointing of God upon you and the power of God upon you because of the Spirit of God. Because of these enemies within, around, and beyond, God had to tell Joshua, saying, Be thou courageous. Be of a good courage, because unto this people thou shalt divide the land. Now let's look very closely at these verses. Verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. I've discovered in my experience as uh, a minister of the gospel that we need to be strong, very, very strong. Strong in various aspects. Many times some um, uh, people who take up the work of the ministry, they do not understand how strong we, we ought to be. One, you have to be strong in your conviction and character. If a man is not strong in conviction and character, he will not be able to plow through. Because there are things that the Christian minister believes that is not popular. The virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not popular. And without being strong on your conviction, you are going to waver. Some people are going to bring doubt. They are going to say, maybe that thing is not true. How could a virgin conceive a son? That's a miracle. That's beyond the natural. And yet, the minister of the gospel is called upon to believe that virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That he lived a sinless life. The very son of the living God. If you are ministering in the community of people that are of another religion. And you say, yes, we accept that Jesus lived as an historical figure. But we don't accept that he was different from any of the other prophets that ever lived. How oh, you need to be strong in conviction. That even when you have to give your life for that conviction. That Jesus Christ was not just a human being. He was God of very God, and yet he was also man. Humanity and divinity joined together. Humanity and deity matched together. And yet, without a strong conviction, that will be impossible. That Jesus died and he rose the third day. That will not bargain on that truth. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will not be quiet about it. And that only through Jesus Christ can we be saved. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. I've discovered that there are many people that will try to shift you away from that faith that has been delivered unto the saints once for all. And therefore you need to be strong. Think about Joshua going to the land of Canaan. He needed to be strong in conviction because in Canaan, it was polytheism. That is, the belief in many, many gods. The god of the sun, the god of the fire, the god of the moon, the god of the river. But Israel believed in the only true God, just one God. And that will run across and against the convictions of the Canaanites. And without that conviction on what God had said, this man could not have been able to go ahead. Not only that, there are things that the Christian minister will believe and preach that will seem unreasonable to people around us. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Immediately people are born again. 
a gospel minister will call those people if they are really genuinely converted he wants them according to the instruction of the lord to be baptized in water he goes and sure enough there are people that will say can't we just uh, leave out that how important is that one sometimes there are university uh, people that come into uh, the church and uh, they will say they will talk grammar and talk uh, english and talk um, whatever it is they want to talk and say is this necessary and we'll say jesus said so and then they will bring a lot of arguments and if you are going to really do the work of the lord in the church of the lord you will need to be strong in conviction can you imagine joshua bringing the children of israel to the very borders of jericho and the enemies were looking at them and before they crossed river jordan god said let all the men that had not circumcised that had not been circumcised all those 40 years those were the men of war if any war arose these were the people that will stand up and fight against the enemy and god said let all of them before you cross over let them be circumcised over here and take the reproach away at gilgal without strong conviction a man will not be able to do that because that man should remember that when the Shechemites circumcised many, many days before, years before in Genesis, the sons of Jacob went and killed all those people when they were weak because of the circumcision. And here we come, right at the borders, at the territory of the enemy. And then Joshua was told to circumcise all these uh, children of Israel. That takes conviction of thus says the Lord. And if you are going to do the work of the Lord, you need conviction. Conviction. Thus says the Lord. Many years ago, I remember, when we just started in deeper life, and we believed in the Bible that says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Of course, there was opposition. But without conviction, standing and saying, here is where we stand, we wouldn't have been where we are today. I remember many years ago when we taught evangelism, personal evangelism. And we told all those young people and we said, go ahead and evangelize. Without conviction, that would be impossible. I remember many years ago when we began to teach our people that sickness is not from the Lord. That he says, I am the Lord that healeth you. And that God will not give his children sickness. I received some opposition in some quarters. But you know, without conviction, a man will not be able to continue. I was in Britain just uh, last month at the um, Assemblies of God Home Missions. And I was given opportunity to preach a number of times on church growth. Different areas of church growth. And um, I talked on no divorce and remarriage. Of course, I knew before I ever got there. And some people had even spoken to me individually about ministers divorcing their wives and taking new wives. And I spoken to me about marrying people that had been divorced in the churches. But I have strong conviction on what the Bible says. And I went ahead and preached with strong conviction now if i didn't have conviction i wonder if i say what i wanted to say the people may not invite me back again but what if you are not invited back again i have enough to do in nigeria if i'm not invited back again that gives more opportunity to go to many churches that are even saying why remain in deeper life alone now that we're having conferences among churches why not come to our church if they don't invite me there that gives me more opportunity here and because of that i gave them the conviction the other thing that makes preachers afraid is that what if they don't give me offering if i tell the truth but who needs an offering in any case because if we ruin our ministry for the case for the sake of an offering you yourself will be an offering on the altar of the world but if you have a strong conviction and you know that this is thus says the lord and you stand upon that conviction 
then the Lord will carry you through. And you will not fail. But do you know, instead of those people not inviting me back again, they did. In fact, there are more invitations than I can honor. Because I told them what I have learned from the Bible. I got to a Bible school in Britain, and there are so many of them there. And um, the Christianity over there is uh, different from the Christianity over here. And uh, while I was speaking to all those students, I said, now you are going out, and you are going to preach the gospel. And then I told them about Bible stand on restitution. You stole somebody's shirt, and you are still wearing that shirt. And then you go out preaching the gospel, and that shirt is still on you. Return the shirt before you give him the gospel. And then when I finished, some of them were asking questions. I said, that is the Bible. And eventually, when they were asking too many questions, their principal rose up and said, well, students, it's only that you're asking the questions because you have not been taught in this school. You'll see that this minister from Africa, he referred to the Bible in everything that he said. That is, the only problem is because you have not been taught. And they kept quiet. But suppose I had no conviction. We must have conviction. And whatever you are doing in the church, make sure that you are not going to please men. You are not going to please the Canaanites or even the Israelites. You will say, oh Lord, you have called me and I will not disappoint you. Do you know if you take that decision, God will back you up. The power of God will support you. And you will never fail in Jesus' name. Amen. You are becoming too quiet. Have I stepped on your toes? Are you still happy with me? Yes. You must be happy. We are men of strong conviction. Now, therefore, that is why that God told Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Many of the things that God told Joshua to do, if he didn't have courage, how will he do it? They had just been defeated in AI. And he went before the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why is it this has happened unto us? And God said, There is sin in the camp. And he began to find out. And it was Achan that had taken that thing. What were they to do? God said, get rid of him. That takes conviction. In the church, to discipline people that sin in the church, it takes conviction. That's why some churches don't grow. Because there are some people over there. They will commit adultery in the church. They commit fornication in the church. And then when you want to touch them, and you want to say, well... Elder, you have been an elder in our church, but now look at what you did. He said, yes. How about David? Didn't David commit adultery? And you say, are we going to fill the whole church with David committing adultery? Now, we're going to take the eldership away from you. Ah, he said, if you do it, I will break this church. You think you are a pastor? I will show you I'm an elder. And then you sound the opinion of some elders and you say, Elder, did you hear the story of uh, so-and-so, Elder? And they say, yes, we heard. And then you go to another person, did you hear this? Yes, we heard. I'm thinking that I want to take a serious stand against that elder. He must be disciplined. And the older elder said, if you do it, young man, this church will break. Ah. Elder, who has been in this church for 50 years, you want to discipline him. Okay, go ahead and break the church. All the property of the church will take everything away. You will go out of this church empty handed and go and start another ministry. And then, uh, then you see the elder that committed the sin. And you say, hmm. Anyway, God will catch you. <laughs> Pastor is not able to catch you. It's only God that can catch elder. It takes conviction. For you to understand that if Satan is standing behind them, God is standing behind you. And that if you go ahead and do the will of God, they may shout, they may cry, but you will overcome. And you will stand like the rock of Gibraltar. And you will say, here is where I stand. In this church where God has made me a pastor, Achan must be disciplined. Amen. You know, when you do that, 
First of all, in the first week, some people will be going around, maybe they will be gossiping. But you are on your knees praying. You are saying, God, vindicate yourself. Glorify yourself. And eventually, all those people, if God needs to give them a dream, if God wants to just smite them down like Saul on the way, of, to, to, on the way to Damascus, God will do something. They will come and bend the knee before you. But it takes conviction and courage that this is where I stand in Israel. Joshua needed to understand that if they brought in another part of traditional worship, from all the things they learned from Canaan, Joshua must stand. Not only dividing the land to them, but making sure that the religion of Israel remained pure. And it will stand against idolatry, coming from any direction. But sometimes, in our churches, you are a pastor in the church. And a young man will go to a fellowship somewhere and come back to the church to introduce something. That has a smack of idolatry. Something that is not completely New Testament. And uh, while he's doing that thing, you want to talk, but he's a youth pastor. He forgot that you put him there. And all the youth in that place, they forgot that you put them there. And then uh, eventually you call this youth uh, leader. And you say, youth leader, I'm the pastor in this church. The way you are leading these uh, young people, you are leading them astray. Look, you brought in this idea, you brought in this idea, you brought in this idea. And this young person might say, yes, pastor, old men, uh, they won't understand. But today, today is the time for young people. And that's what they're doing in America, doing in Britain, and doing all over, all over the world. Therefore, that's what we're going to do. And you tell them that, according to the Bible, and I'm the pastor here, this will not be done. And he says, ah, pastor, if you uh, do that, if you take that stand, I'm going to take all the young people. Before it happens, I will tell you. I'll take all the young people and start another fellowship with them. Pastor, what are you going to do? Are you in control? To the point you'll be able to say, young man, if you do that, God will teach you a lesson. And it will show you that there is a pastor here appointed of God. And that he will back up the pastor he has appointed. And therefore you have control. Because you are watching over their souls as somebody that will give account. But you know, if we don't have convictions like this, there will be no courage. And they will be pushing us here and there. Not only that, sometimes you need courage with people that are outside the church. Just yet this year, some months ago, a uh, commissioner of police uh, or... I've forgotten, senior police, I've uh, forgotten the title now, sent for me. And some constables came to Bagada. And he said, a police, the policeman is calling you at the station. Now, I said, Pastor, I have authority. So I said, where is the letter they brought? I sent somebody to them. I said, go and ask them, did they bring a letter in their hand? And the person I sent uh, said, uh, no, they didn't have a letter. I said, I didn't even come out to see them. I said, go and tell them to go back to the police station that I am pastor and I'm a responsible person. If they want me at the police station, let them go and bring a letter. That's authority. And uh, they went. And I, after they went, they told the other man that uh, <laughs> that man is not as simple as we thought. <laughs> He said we should go and bring a letter. And eventually I went there at, uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When I got there, I, I saw the person and I said, uh, that's the, their boss. I said, uh, they said you are, you are calling me. That I'm so and so. Oh, he said yes, that's sit down. Then there was another policeman there. And I went with two other people from our church. And I sat down and I relaxed. Because... <laughs> I had not done any criminal thing. <laughs> I am a preacher of the gospel. Yes. And so he said that, uh, well, we have received a report in our station here that your church is uh, preaching, uh, being born again, as if all the other people are not born again. I said, excuse me, is that what you called me for? He said, uh, yes. I said, 
are you is it part of your responsibility to interpret the bible to the preacher and tell the preacher what to preach i thought you called me for something good that i am so and so i teach that ye must be born again and that when you are born again your life will change and that we are the people changing the country that the work you have left undone you hear out about that unrest in the north you didn't go there to go and make a change my said that is bringing peace in the country you are calling me for question he said i am sorry i said no don't be sorry <laughs> i said don't be sorry at all but i thought you were calling me because uh, something serious had happened that yes i preached being born again and we preach without willingness no man shall see the lord yeah. oh he said that uh, we heard that you make some people that when they belong to your church they shouldn't go to other church i said is that news that don't you know when somebody is at the morning service in a church by the fact that he's in the morning service in my church he cannot be in the other church at the same time i said yes that is true then he said i'm sorry and then he gave me his address and then at, at last said, well, be praying for me. I said, you need prayer. <laughs> Without conviction. If you don't have conviction, they'll be drib dribbling us here and there. They'll be dictating to us what to do. But when you know that, by the grace of God, you are a child of God and a minister of the gospel, you will stand. And believing God, you will stand. Amen. Now remember, the enemy within the enemy around, the enemy beyond. That's why that God told Joshua over and over again, be courageous and be of a strong mind because unto these people you will deliver the land and divide the land. Then in verse 8 he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Let's preach the word. Preaching the word. That the book of God will not depart out of your mouth. Now, our younger people, what they're looking for is the teaching of the word of God. And my brothers and the few sisters that are around, if we will stand upon the word of God, I believe that the churches will grow. Because God will back up his word. And any question and any problem that comes up in the church you know that by the grace of god this is the word you know what gives uh, the preacher conviction and what gives the preacher courage is the word take the doctor for example the doctor has a patient and this patient is very very sick almost dying and then the doctor tried to attend to him looking at all the things that are written in the medical books and as he attended to him it looks temporarily that the man is becoming even more sick worse the doctor went back to the medical book and as he saw in the medical book he saw that he had done the right thing and said the right thing that will give him courage and conviction he will tell the relatives don't worry even though he appears to be growing worse, I have done everything that the medical books say I should do. Therefore, he will become better. What's his confidence? What gives him courage? The medical book. A lawyer has a case in hand, and the case looks hopeless. But all through the night, all through the days, he went on reading the law books. Then he got to the court. He knew that the judge himself and all the other lawyers they depend on this same law book and it said everything according to the law and it appeared for a moment that the case is going to go down and the case is going to be against his client but he remembers everything i have said has been according to the law book that will give him courage he knows that at last he will have the victory look at a mechanic this big machine in the, vac in the factory has broken down. And it appears that everybody is perplexed. But he has the manual for the machine. 
And he goes to read that manual and he continues to work on that machine. Other people came and they said, no, this thing will not work. This thing will not work. He continues doggedly, unreservedly, continues working on that uh, big machine. Eventually, people ask him, why are you so confident and courageous to keep on doing the same thing you are doing when we're all telling you that it will not work? And then he will say, I checked up in the manual. It is the word or the law that gives either the doctor or the engineer or the lawyer the confidence and the courage the same thing with the child of God and the minister of the gospel stick to the book stick to the book if you remain with this word of God and it says this word of the law of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth you remain with the word of God you read it every day and every night. You stand upon it. You obey it yourself. You trust, you trust in that word of God and you teach it convincingly. It might appear that other people are saying, your church will not grow, your church will not grow, but your church will grow. Amen. Because God is going to back up the word. It is not the name of the church that matters. It is what you are preaching in that church that matters. Whatever the name. Whatever the title you go with, if you'll go back to the word and you'll be courageous standing upon the word of God, it's only a matter of time. Onlookers will know that God is working with you. Now, don't be discouraged. We might have been doing something for five years, for six years, and for seven years, and uh, we say, what's all this? It looks like I'm missing it somewhere, but the moment... You make up your mind and you say, I will be courageous. And it doesn't matter what other people think. And I will stand upon the word of God. Remember, the blood to cleanse you of the enemy within. The love to shield you from the enemies around. And the power of the spirit of God to give you overcoming power and authority to conquer on the enemies outside and beyond, I believe that you will overcome. Amen. And the work will prosper. Amen. And the work will succeed. Amen. All that God is looking for is for another Moses. Not necessarily having the name of Moses, but having the conviction, the courage, and the character of Moses that can stay before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And as you look at Moses all through his ministerial life. Everything the Lord told him, even though it may look unreasonable, he did everything. And God honored the faith and the ministry of that man. And if we will have the same courage and the same conviction, God will honor your convictions also in Jesus' name. Amen. I have found in my own uh, life and in the ministry that God has given me, that the courage and the conviction matters a lot. And sometimes I've taken some decisions and taken some stand that temporarily people will think that, ah, that will ruin that ministry. Just some four years ago, a white man got interested in what we're doing in deeper life. And he said that uh, I booked for you to go to America, to go to Canada, and go to a lot of places. And uh, you will be able to minister over the radio and over the television. And uh, they will, this is uh, work that we're doing in Nigeria. Nobody knows about it, but I will uh, do it that they will know. And I said, well, that's all right if that is the will of God. And we booked the flights, and we got to America. And we got to CBN, Pat Robertson's um, television um, station. And uh, we had some 10 minutes uh, discussion on a round table. Then we went to Toronto. Then we came to Tulsa. In Tulsa, we were discussing. And um, this man started discussing money. And uh, if this happened, then he'll get this money. I was surprised because he didn't tell me all that before. And then I told him that I'm a preacher. I'm not a businessman. And then he got angry. 
Then I looked at him and I said, the Bible says, I shouldn't go along with an angry man. And I'm standing on that. And I said, I'm going back to Nigeria from that place. And we still needed to go to a lot of other places where he had booked down that, you know, they will know me and know my ministry. He didn't know that I was serious. So the following day, we got to the airport. And he put down his ticket and checked to the next place we should have gone on our itinerary. Then I put my ticket down and I said, check me too on my way back home. He looked at me. He thought I was mad. Because he felt that he could do something for deeper life. And that we couldn't get what he will do for us in any other way. But I'm following God, not following man. And I came back to Nigeria. Later he wrote to me. Because nobody ever did that to him in his life. But do you know, all those places we would have gone, God has brought everything about without him. I've gone back to CBN on my own because of the way God worked it out. And I've been on their program. I've gone to Canada. I've been on their program. I've been um, to Canada for another program, five programs, all in a series. Television, all free. Here in Nigeria, we pay. Over there, we don't pay anything. And then came back to America on radio station in 66 radio stations, all free. Not only that it was free, messages that are preached in other places in cassettes, they offer to those people on the radio station, and the people were applying for those messages. If I'd gone along with him, I would have been a servant. He will get angry, but because I'm a black man, a mistake for a white man is perfection for a black man. I would have been a servant just following after him, whether I was keeping to the scriptures or not. But I said, promotion does not come from United States of America or Britain. It comes from the Lord. And if you will take your stand on the word of God, those people will come and learn from you. Because it's not only deeper life that can grow large. Your church also will grow large. Amen. God will support any man, any woman, anywhere that will stand on the word of God. And I want you to put God to test. We have heard of D.L. Moody. We have heard of Spurgeon. We have heard of John Wesley. We have heard of Billy Graham. Those of you who are sitting here, God can make you like that. Amen. It is not their white skin. It is the consecration of their heart. And if you will tell God from tonight, well, not, this is not just deeper life now. God is no respecter of persons. What he has done with anybody, deeper life or no deeper life, is able to do with another person. And if you will say, oh Lord, whatever it takes, you are telling me to be courageous and I will have the victory, I am going to be courageous, you will have the victory. It may take some months, it may take some years, but if you are consistent, you will have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. And no enemy shall be able to stand before you. Amen. And nothing will be able to defeat the work that God is doing in your own life. Amen. It's between you and God. God can have another Joshua today, another Elijah today, another David today, another Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, another Peter or Paul, if we will tell God, Lord, I am available. God is wanting to do great things because he's a great God. Great people don't enjoy doing small, small things all through the time. God is a great God. He wants to do great things. And God doesn't want to be limited to just one denomination doing great thing. God wants the opportunity in your own church to do something great. And if you will open the door and say, God, I am a candidate for a great ministry. And whatever it takes, I will do. You will see that God will raise up a great ministry through you. I believe he's going to do it. We are going to pray and tell the Lord. There are other references I wanted to read, but... Uh, it's not how many references we read that matters. It is what God is planting in the heart that matters. I believe God has planted something in your heart right now already. And the seed of greatness that is planted in your heart, I believe it will grow. Amen. I believe it will grow. Amen. 
so make yourself available to god and say god i'll be courageous no matter the enemy within enemy around enemy enemy beyond i'll do what you want me to do and victory is definite let's rise up and pray now i want us to be very definite when god begins to work within six months he can do more than we expect in fa for five years and I want you to remove from your mind that maybe God is doing that because of deeper life. He's no respecter of persons. Whatever God has done with any other man, he can do with you. As a man, as a woman, you came to this conference because there is something inside your heart. You feel the call of God. And you know that the hand of the Lord is upon you. Don't allow any little thing somewhere to weaken you or to paralyze you and don't allow some things that are not eternal to spoil the ministry the great ministry god has put in your hand if there's been mistakes in the past don't let us allow a mistake of two years ago three years ago five years ago ruin the whole of our future let's set all those mistakes with god even if it is it was sin don't allow that burden of sin, that guilt of sin that happened some time ago to cripple you all through for the rest of your life. Settle everything with God and say, God, from now on, I am what you say I am. I can do what you say I can do. And I'm not going to look back. And if there's any difficulty in the church, when God shows you how to solve that difficulty, be courageous and bold. Don't look at the faces of men. There is nothing anybody can do against you. You are a servant of God. God has called you. He has put his word in your mouth. And if you do the will of the Lord, nobody can conquer you. So be definite now while you pray. And tell the Lord, I will do what you want me to do. I will achieve what you want me to achieve. He wants you to hold crusade. Go ahead. He wants the church to be, to be great. Go ahead. And be strong in the Lord. And be strong in the Lord. And be strong in the Lord. Don't let anything paralyze you. Don't let anything weaken you. You can do the will of God. It will be done. It will be done. It will be done. Now we are going to pray together. But we are not going to pray like the people who just pray only to end up a meeting. We believe what we are praying for. Because there are many people in the history of the church that have been changed just at a moment of time. And our lives and ministries can be changed just this moment of time. There is no time to waste. The work is much. And God has found you a minister in his hand. And I will make the best use of you. And we're going to rise up out after this conference. And we're going to do exploits for the Lord. Amen. All fear and timidity will vanish away. Amen. And the courage that we need for the work will be given unto us. All of us who are here, men and women, let us understand, we are not here by accident. We are here by God's appointment. And the will of the Lord will be done. Almighty God will come before you. You have called us. You have, we have responded to your call. We have come from different ministries, fellowships and denominations. But Lord, to you, it doesn't matter the name. It doesn't matter the place. The sin that matters is that we love you. And you have called us. And you have given the work in our hand. Therefore, Lord, I pray for your people, your ministers, your servants. Oh, Lord, I pray. Where there has been sin in the past, shortcoming in the past, trying to weaken anyone, trying to paralyze anyone, because you are a merciful God, forgive in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Lord, we pray that the blood of Jesus Christ that washes whiter than snow will wash all the hearts of your servants in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we know when you forgive, you forget. All the time that the devil has been bringing up that same old story, that same old sin again, oh Lord, we pray from now on that your people will arise without guilt and without condemnation, without looking back and without being bound by all the things that happened in the past. Oh Lord, I just pray that the past will be totally under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I pray that from now on, the power, the anointing, the authority that you used in backing up the early New Testament ministers, those same qualities will back up all your servants that are here this day in Jesus' name. Amen. In the time of difficulty, give your servants wisdom. Amen. In the time of scarcity, Lord, you are the God that provides for all our need. According to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus, David said, I've been young, now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, or his sons or children begging bread. Therefore, Lord, I pray, as these your servants have left many things behind, and now they're serving you, preaching the gospel, Lord, they will not beg. They will not be hungry. And Lord, you will meet all their needs in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray that as they go back, the various assemblies and churches, your power will work mightily. Amen. As they lay their hands on the sick, the sick shall recover. Amen. As they speak the word of authority against evil spirits, those evil spirits will depart in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, you have told us that if we speak to a mountain to be removed, and we don't doubt in our heart, but we really sincerely wholeheartedly believe that it shall be so, you say it shall be so. Therefore, Lord, in unity of faith, all the mountains that have been before your servants, before your ministers, that have been crippling their ministry, hindering the progress in their ministries, with combined faith, we speak to those mountains to get out of their sight in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray things will be different. Like as we have been helping other ministers and their churches are growing, O oh Lord, I pray, these ministers that are here, who have come into covenant with you, your work in their hand will grow. Amen. Your work in their hand will prosper. Amen. And you will do mighty things through them in Jesus' name. Amen. When they are confronted by powers of darkness, by evil powers, by familiar spirits, by people that are working against them secretly, oh Lord, I pray that the giant on the inside of them, the greater one that lives inside them, will give them the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. At all times, on the pulpit, before the children of God, or at the crusade field, or any time in their personal lives, in their own families, the courage that brings victory will be available to every, every one of us whenever we need it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray everyone will enter into a new realm of ministry. Amen. New manifestation of authority and power. Amen. That Lord, the great things we have heard you have done with other ministries and other ministers. With all these people who are here, you'll do in Jesus name Amen. and like you magnified the ministry of Joshua to the Canaanites you'll magnify the ministries of these your servants that you have called to your own glory and for the salvation of multitudes we believe that you have answered us for in Jesus mighty name we pray
because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I just thank God, third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't 